Well, so my word this morning that the Lord gave, the word the Lord gave me this morning, <clears throat> um, probably not, definitely not a traditional uh, Christmas Eve, uh, you know, word, but I'm excited about it. I definitely have, the Lord's allowed me to intertwine some things having to do with Christmas, but I'm continuing the prayer series because one of the things that the Lord has really put on my heart is the importance of prayer. And I feel like in the church that that has lacked uh, in, in the lives of believers and then also in churches corporately. And there's a big difference between individual prayer, which I really, really love. I mean, I love to get along with the Lord. It's so powerful. Amen. Um, but also corporate prayer, which takes a little bit more time to get used to. Um, but I'm telling you, there's a lot of power in that also. Amen. And I'm really trying to encourage our church to really, to really be encouraged to become part of a unified body. Look, the word came forth, right? Amen. What a great word yes, of unity yes. because God is not a God of division. And there's a little bit of that in the message this morning too. Praise God. So I know that the Lord is really trying and trying to hone in to, to really get a hold of our hearts. But that when we come together, if we're praying in unity for God to move. And, and, and you know, whenever again, part of what her dream was about was that the church was filled and that there was, a, there was revival going on. But I need you to understand my concept of revival. It's not just about numbers. Yes, usually when God starts moving, people start coming. But it's about a revival of the heart. That's really what the Word of God talks about, where people's hearts are revived. And when something's revived, the Word is only used two times in the New Testament. Okay, it's used in Romans two times, right? And it's talking about, it's talking about something that was dead and then came back to life. It was talking about sin was dead and revived, but then it talked about Jesus was dead and revived. And so when revival hits, what happens is things that were dead come back to life because the Holy Spirit breathes life into that which was dead and the resurrection power of God starts to move. And God, we need a revival in the church, right? I mean, I, mean I, I, I hope that you can agree with me. God wants to, do. listen, we are getting, we are in the last days. People are not confused of this. I talk to people about this all the time in the clinics that I work in, people that are not even saved, and I'm like, what you think's going on? And, and, and everybody kind of has an idea that something real weird is going on ever since COVID, but everybody don't really want to come out and say what they think it is. I'm going to tell you what it is. We're in the last days. And if you read your Bible, you need to brace yourself. You need to get ready. You need to get prayed up. You need to let the Holy Spirit have his way in your heart and in your life. And we need to get woke. Amen. I was telling somebody that yesterday. We need to get woke, but not to what the world wants us woke to. We need to get woke to the Holy Ghost. We need to get walked to the truth of God's word. Wake us up, Lord. Let us not be sleepy like Peter in the garden. Amen. That's just a little, that's just a little side note, right? Yes. All right. So, so look, we've been doing a series where the disciples had reached out to Jesus and they said, teach us to pray like John called his disciples. And so the Lord in another spot says, you know, our father who art in heaven. He said, pray like this. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses. Some scripts, some translations say debts. As we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. And that was what he said to them. Now, you can turn that into a prayer that that's how you say your nighttime prayers, right? But what I really believe that the Lord was trying to show us was these, it's almost like, I'm, I'm, listen, this is my opinion. Bullet, I can't prove, so I'm going to let you know it's my opinion. It's more like a bullet point on what we should be including in our prayers. Amen? And so we've already covered our Father. We've already covered who art in heaven. And we've already covered hallowed be thy name. Unfortunately, some people in the church were sick and we don't have that one up. We didn't video it. And tonight, I'm going to do part number one of your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And part number one has a little subtitle. You ready? It's about the individual. So it's about you tonight. It's about me. What God wants to do, his will on earth for individuals. Amen? And so, you know, one time I was in prayer and I got a response from the Lord. You ever praying and, and the Lord just just rolls up on you and speaks to you? That's a that's a good thing. Now it's not always always real encouraging, but this was encouraging because He was speaking to me. But this is, was a response. He says, "I know what you need from me, son. I hear your prayers, but I have a question for you. What about me? 
This, this is really what the Lord said to me. But what about me, man? They, my people want me involved in the issues of their life. And they pray to me. And they cry out to me. But what about me, man? What about what I want? Because I want my people involved with me in what I'm doing on the earth. And so much of my message today, I want you to know, is connected to that thought process. So the question has to be, what is he doing? And what is his will? So this is part one about the individual. And God's will for the earth begins with the lives of individuals. Amen. In the beginning, God, God's word spoke forth and produced everything according to its own kind. Some of this may be a little review for some of you that have been coming to the church. Because some of these themes have kind of been repetitive. But I'm not ashamed of repetition. All right. That in the beginning, God's word produced everything according to his own kind. And each creation had within it the seed that made it able to reproduce after its own kind. And God said, it is good. Amen. And whenever he created man, he intended for man to reproduce after his own kind. And when man was created from the earth, which was not fallen yet when God created Adam, that he was created in the image and likeness of God. And so therefore, in that state, had man in that state, in that condition, reproduced after his own kind, he would have been reproducing in the image and likeness of God. There's multiple scriptures throughout that say that the glory of the Lord will fill the earth. Amen. But what I need you to understand is, is that the fall took place. And you understand that. And the scripture teaches that the fall perverted God's plan. Now humanity has a sinful nature. Hence the lyric. Uh, how did it go again? I'm sorry. Hate, hate is strong and mocks the song. Hence the lyric. Hate is strong and mocks the song. Because as man reproduces after his fallen image from his father Adam upon the earth, the glory of God is not filling the earth. Instead, wickedness, darkness, chaos is filling the earth. And if you don't see that, then you just don't really want to see that. we got to be real in what we're dealing with because hopefully it will stir our spirit up to understand that we need the Lord to do a work on the inside of us. Amen? So that we can do what it is that he's called us to do. So instead of the image and likeness of God, then it's this image that's causing chaos and confusion right, upon right. the earth. But God does not change his mind. And the scripture said, this is where it started for me in Numbers chapter 14, verse 21. It said this, that as surely as he lives, his glory will fill this earth. God's up to something, my friend. He's been up to something, but he's about to kick it in overdrive. I believe that with all my heart. So we as people pray and we pray. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So let's talk a little bit about the plan. So you know this already, but he created a nation from a man. He created a nation from a na man named Abraham, and the name of that nation was Israel. And through this nation, the world was given a king. Amen? God the Son left heaven and was born a man on earth. And that is the Christmas story, is it not? God the Son was born of a virgin, born the King of Kings, in the lowest of human circumstances. This to me shows me God's heart. Jesus told us during times, and I had some of these scriptures in here and I didn't keep them, but I feel led by the Lord to say this. Jesus told us in many of his teachings that, that the Pharisees, you know, this is just perfect because I was going to put this up here, but I got rid of the scriptures. The Pharisees love to sit in Moses' seat. Oh, the religious heart. He loves his honor. He loves his accolades. Huh? Come on, somebody. Yeah, yeah. He loves to, to be seen by men. He wants his works to be seen by men. God's not pleased with that. He said he will not share his glory with another. And what God wants is for there to be less of us and more of him. And that's what John the Baptist said. And, and so, so this is what God, so, so that's the Christmas story. He was, he was born in the lowest of human circumstances, in a stable, with animals. Yeah. And, and, and baby Jesus, his bed was a manger, which is like a feeding trough. And, and he's trying to speak to us about that. Through that birth, he's, 
He's prophetically speaking to us about that. That it's supposed to be less of us and more of him. That we're not supposed to be high and mighty. Jesus also said, what are you going to do if some man comes in in nice clothes? You're going to call him up to the front. If somebody else comes in and they're not as well dressed, you're going to look down on them. Yeah, I mean, you kind of you kind of stink a little bit once you sit in the back. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? But that's what people do. Come on. You, you, you think pastors don't, they're not going to say that. But, but you think that sometimes men of God, people of God, they're not wanting to pray in millionaires into their church? But but you, do you think that the Lord's really worried about that? Do you really think that the Lord's really overly worried about making you or I a millionaire? Do you, do does God does that happen sometimes that God blesses people like that? Absolutely. Should we be seeking uh, like fervently to become millionaires? No, I don't think that we should. I think we should be seeking fervently the heart of God, the will of God, to be involved in the work of God. Amen. For what He's really doing on the earth. And if we will be about our father's business, I believe that he will bless us in those other areas. Amen. I wrote this down. He was born to die because we were born already dead. Because the wages of sin is death. But his death brought, bought sinners new life. They just have to be willing to be born again. And once you know, once we're born again, the spirit of God lives on the inside of us. And this, but this is just the beginning. You know, I'm not going to preach this, but I was just listening to a preacher the other day, and he said, you know, that many times, even with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we probably don't really preach that enough in this church. I'm just going to be real with you, but we believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We are a Pentecostal church. We are a charismatic church. We believe that there's something after salvation. Amen. Now, listen, I'm starting to kind of wonder if I always had it right or not exactly the way that it all works. But I know this, I know that I was filled with, I know I was filled with the Holy Spirit whenever I was saved. Amen. And I know that one day when I was worshiping the Lord, all of a sudden, hallelujah, I'm not going to tell you the story because it's a long story. All of a sudden, the language of tongues started bubbling out of me. Amen. And the spirit of God started flowing out of me. I believe in the prayer language of tongues. I believe that you must be baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit to overflowing. But many times people, at least in Pentecostal denominations, okay, have taken the position that you got you get saved, you get filled with the Holy Ghost, and they were looking at as a goal, and this preacher said, I don't think it's a goal, I think it's a gateway. Yeah. It's an open door to lead you to what yeah. comes next. Yeah. The gifts of the Spirit, prophetic utterances, yeah. to see healings taking place, yeah. to How? see the Spirit of God yeah. moving in the hearts and lives of people. Yeah. Amen? Amen. And, and I believe that. That sounds right to me. Because, because half the time, whenever people get filled with the Holy Spirit, they say that they're speaking in tongues, but they ain't witness to anybody in a month of Sundays. So I'm ain't right with that picture, my friend. And instead, half the time, they just judging other people down their, their religious noses. Looking at everybody down their religious nose. And I got the Holy Ghost. With, what's wrong with you? And, and in reality, their hearts aren't right. The Lord's a whole lot more worried about our hearts being right. Come on. He wants us to let him search our hearts. The psalmist said it. And I preached it last Wednesday. Wednesday uh, search our hearts and try our reins. Lord, look on the inside and do a work on the inside of us. Amen. Amen. Yes, Praise Lord. God. So look, point number one is this, about the individual, about God's plan for the individual, God's will on earth for the individual. He wants true conversions. I know I said a little bit of some, I, honestly, this was already written and I hadn't read it in two weeks when I preached Wednesday, I promise you. So I didn't change the whole message that was in here, so I felt like he wanted to say it. He wants true conversions. It's his will. Right. It's God's will for individual people's lives for there to be a true conversion yes. that takes place in their life. Yes. And listen, I'm going to I'm going to hammer that point a little bit because I want us to understand that that when I say true conversion, it means something. Words mean something. Right. Because not everybody that says that they're saved is necessarily or thinks that they're saved is necessarily saved. I'm not the Holy Spirit to judge that, but I can tell you what the word of God says now. Can you do me a favor? Do you, do you know how to click on the NASB version? Because this first scripture I have is Ephesians 1.13 in the NASB. And I wanted you to see this one on the screen. I probably won't do this with all of them. <clears throat> but I wanted you to see Ephesians 1.13. And this is what the scripture says. It says, in him, there we go. you also, after listening to the message of truth, 
the gospel of your salvation, <clears throat> having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. So you may not be able to see it from over there, but I want you to point, I want you to see this in case your translation is different. It says, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed. See, it's more than just hearing it. It's more than just listening it to it. The person must believe it. And when we're talking about believing, we have other scriptures that can lead us to what that means. Because in Romans 10, and we don't have to turn there, but for the sake of time, but in Romans 10, it says you must believe from your heart yes. and confess with your mouth. Now, let me tell you what happens. Don't take that down yet. When you listen to the truth. The truth of the gospel, and right now I'm talking about conversion. I'm talking about God the Father sent His Son to be born in human form. God became flesh in human form. Amen. And now we can be born again. Praise God because He died on the cross. Right. Okay. And when I tell you the story of the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and, you, and a person listens, and they believe. Not just in their mind. Okay. We got to get that straight. It says you must believe from your heart. Now, I believe this. I don't really believe you can completely believe from your heart till you first believe with your mind. I believe that you have to understand. Now, I could be wrong on that, too, because sometimes people just like they, they don't even know what they believe in, but they know they believe they're being ministered to by the anointing of the Holy Spirit right. when the word of God is going forth. And they're like, OK, Jesus, amen. Uh, come on, Jesus. I need you. They feel it in their spirit and they cry out. That's believing with their heart. Amen. Right. But, but usually right. you, you believe with your mind first. Right? Okay, I believe that. It's bearing witness with, with my spirit. And then, but, but now I'm, I'm ready to believe with my heart. Amen? And I cry out to God from my heart. And I call on Jesus from my heart. And whenever I do that, the Bible says right there, it says this. It says that you would be sealed in him with the Holy Spirit. I promise. See, that's a true conversion. Sometimes true conversions take place in vacation Bible school when the little kids Amen. lift Amen. their hands up. Amen? Amen. Yes. Sometimes yes. they don't. Right, right. I believe that. It's never bad when a little kid raises their hand and prays a prayer. Right. It's never bad for us to lead people through a prayer of salvation. There's nothing wrong with that. If a person is willing to pray a prayer like that, praise God. That's a sign that their heart's open. But true conversion takes place when that happens right there. You understand that? When you become sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. And you know how you know that you're sealed? You're different. Right. Something happens on the inside. Now, you can try to suppress it. You can try to suppress it. You can decide not to feed it. You can go against it. And I personally also believe you can lose it. Okay. But if you'll feed it, hallelujah, it'll grow. Amen. So I also want you to know this. You, and, and you don't have to go there. But in John chapter 1 verse 4, it said this. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. I want you to think about that. The world was so dark. Before Jesus came. Right. And, and God sent Jesus to be born on the earth in the midst of darkness. And he was the life of God that came from heaven. That's why the love of God and the life of God is so different than our mind is used to. We're not, we're not really used to it. It takes a long time to really begin to understand the kingdom of God. If you don't read your Bible... You're not going to be able to understand the kingdom of God. Right. If you don't spend time in the presence of the in prayer with God, it's going to be difficult for you to understand who you even are in Christ and whether or not you're really intimate with him or not. That's just another story. Well, it's really about this story. But in him was life. God the Father sent life to the earth and the life was the light of men. Amen. The Holy Spirit overshadowed her. Right. And she became pregnant with Jesus. I want you to know something. If you're a believer here this morning, you are not a citizen. I'm sorry to those that are not believers. You are not a citizen of the kingdom unless the Holy Spirit overshadows you and you become pregnant with Jesus. No, let me say that again, because that's, be that, that's better preaching than what you're amen. And it might make you feel a little bit funny. But look. The Holy Spirit overshadowed her. She became pregnant with Jesus. And you cannot be a citizen of the kingdom of God unless the Holy Spirit overshadows you also. And you become pregnant with Jesus on the inside of you. When Jesus is born in you, you become different, my friend. You don't want to miss this opportunity. Whoever you are.
are in the sound of my voice, you watch it on video, you in the house of God, you don't want to miss the opportunity of allowing Jesus to come alive on the inside of you. Yes. When Jesus, the light, when the life of Jesus enters, the light of God is turned on. <coughs> Isn't that good? He was the light, and his life was the light of men. <coughs> is your light turned on? <laughs> I was, I was going to do a message one time about that. I had a picture ready for y'all. I was going to use my little keynote thing. It was a picture taken from outer space. And I was just going to try to get you to think about it. It showed like, a con showed like an area in a country with a bunch of lights. And I was thinking about that, too. I started putting lights in the ocean around it. Because, you know, you got captains in the ocean that are believers. And I was thinking how God, when he looks from above, how people's lights, some people's lights are turned on. Amen. And how the father of lights <laughs> is looking down and how he can see if your lights turned on. Amen. And you belong to him. In him, he, in him was life and the life was the light of men. Has your light been turned on? Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. But look, I got to tell you something. The enemy wants to try to thwart the plan of God. And, and in 2 Corinthians, you can put this up, says 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and it, I don't know, this might even be the King James. I can't even keep up with myself what I got in here. In whom the God of this world, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, verses 4 through 6. I think this is King James. In whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not. You understand you're in a war? Right. You understand that you are in a controversy? Absolutely. You're in a war. The enemy wants to blind the minds of human beings from being able to believe in Christ right. and have their light turned on. Right. Uh, it, it, it blinds the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Paul says, we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. And ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. I don't know if you think about these things or not, but look, there's no way for you and I to know God if God the Father doesn't send Jesus. God the Father sends Jesus in physical form so that we can see his mannerisms, we can see his characteristics. We didn't see him face to face, but the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul physically didn't see him. I know he said that Jesus taught him the scriptures in the wilderness, but he didn't walk with him like Peter did. Okay, uh, but 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 he but this is what the scripture is saying. We can see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ because he is the light of God. And the enemy, who is the God of this world, wants to blind the minds of people from truly understanding who God really is. And I and I got to keep saying it. But if we are not really taking the time to really learn the word of God, it's very difficult for us. To have a proper understanding of what God is really doing on the earth. Right. And it's difficult for us to really know whether or not we're truly getting involved in the work of God. Yeah. Now, I don't know if we have any of those left or not, but I'm trying to do a Bible reading campaign. Read the Bible in a year. Because, listen, it, it, I believe God wants to fill the church up. Amen. But the way that if you preach, if you preach the Bible and people have not read the Bible, it's difficult for them yeah. to be able to keep up with preaching. Yeah. That's why we must teach the scriptures. We must preach the scriptures and we must believe God to move by his spirit also. Yeah. Amen. We need the Holy Spirit's help to teach us the word of God. All right. So that was point number one. Point number two is this. The cross is an ongoing work. That's his will. That's his will on earth for the individual. He wants a true conversion, but he wants the work of the cross to keep on going. That's kind of what we preach Wednesday, a crucifixion of the flesh. The, Jesus' cross crucified the, the power of sin. Amen. Your cross. you got to pick up your own cross. Jesus said that. If any man is going to follow after me, he must pick up his cross and, die, and deny himself and follow after me. Now, I'm not trying to say you got your own cross. I believe that your cross is Jesus' cross. But it's you personally picking up that cross and allowing yourself to be crucified. Paul said we die daily. That's the problem with some people in churches. And, and that's been my problem before. I'm, I'm, listen, I'm not ashamed to tell you that I have felt at times thinking that I would have belonged in Moses' seat. I didn't even know that I thought that. Till the Lord woke me up, let my eyes realize 
Who do you think you are? And it's not just me. So don't say, oh, poor pastor. No, you need to look at yourself, Fred. You need to look at yourself in the mirror because you might be having a little bit of issue with that too. Possibly. I'm just saying it's a possibility, right? Because the enemy is not a respecter of persons either. All right? Okay. So look, the cross is an ongoing work. And I want you to know he's changing hearts. Look, can you put Romans chapter 12, verse 2 up? I'm pretty sure this is King James. Uh, Usually I do a lot of deep teaching on this scripture, but I just kind of want to point out a couple of different points. It says, and be not conformed to this world. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind yes. that you may prove what is that good and acceptable yes. and perfect will of God. So, so he's saying the word conformed, I will tell you this, it means to be fashioned from an outside source. So what he's, it, Paul wouldn't say this if it wasn't possible. And he's writing a letter to the church. And he said, this is a letter to the church in Rome. Not the Catholic church. The, the church in Rome. The Catholic church didn't come until 300 years after this letter. Okay. Or about 240 years after this letter. And, and so, but, but what I want you to know is this. Is that he's saying, don't be fashioned from an outer source. So what he's saying is, if you're not careful, you can even as a believer, allow the world to fashion you yeah, into right. their image, yeah. right? Now, I wanted to ask you a couple of questions. This is just something, this is, and this can be interactive, okay? I like interaction, all right? If you feel led to interact, all right? So, let me just see a raise of hands of how many people are natural born citizens of the United States of America. Okay, most of you are, and yet some of you are like, dude, that's a silly question. But if Gaudi was in here, that wouldn't be that silly. Where's Chari? It's Chari. She didn't raise her hand because guess what? She wasn't a natural. But let me tell you, I was thinking about you, sister, last night when I was looking at this, like one o'clock in the morning when I couldn't sleep. Okay, I thought about Chari because see, and so because this is the thing she wasn't a natural born citizen but that sister is a citizen of the united states of america come on and listen when, when she got back from taking the test she started talking about some of them questions and i'm like dude wait i don't i don't know the answers to those questions that sister had to learn that stuff she had to be hungry to be a citizen of the citizen of the united states of america okay that's your natural birth you're, you're either born in Mexico, you're born in the U.S., that's your citizenry and your natural birth. But what about spiritual birth? See, there's a, there's a, you, were, you were also born citizens of the world, were you not? Right. Yes. Come on. Yes. How were you born citizens of the world? Well, you were born, I'm talking about the world. Because you were born of Adam. When you were born of Adam, in your natural birth, you were born a citizen of the world system. And the scripture we've already talked about was the fact that you were born with a sinful nature. And that's what the world has as their nature, a sinful nature. But if you're, if you're, and, and, what is, and if you're born a citizen of the world, you're born bound by a law and it's called the law of sin and death, right? But if you're born a, a citizen of the kingdom of God, how, how many, I know you are. You, you don't have to raise your hand, you might feel... Funny, but look, if you're born again, and we've already talked about that, then you've been born again, and now you've received your citizenship in the kingdom of God. And now you've entered into the kingdom where there's righteousness and life. Because the righteousness of Jesus produces life. Amen? All right. So I like to make people think. Some people don't like to think. Some people like going to movies where you don't really have to think. I don't really go to movies too much anymore, but some people just like those movies where they can just sit there and veg out because they feel like their brain works so much. I don't like those kind of movies. I like the kind of movies that I got to try to figure out and they challenge my brain. Okay, so I'm sorry if you're not like that, but that's who I am. All right, so let me ask you this. So you're, you're born a U.S. citizen. What is the prevalent language, or is supposed to be the prevalent language in the United States of America? English, right? Okay, so, so let me ask you this. What about the prevalent language of the world? Oh, the world. The world. What's the prevalent language of the world? That's kind of a, dude, that's pretty, yeah, that's, that's abstract thought there, man. We really have to kind of use our thinking, put our thinking, what's that, that show that Isabella and Sierra used to watch, PB and J, you got to do the noodle dance on that one, and you're like, whoa, what is the language of the world? What is the language of the world? Well, how do you think you could learn the language of the world? 
Huh? Self. Self. Yeah. But but where are you getting that communication from? It's trying to teach you something. The enemy, right? And 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 so and it's coming from people, right? Where are you? it's coming from culture, right? Right. Social media, right? I know I'm always the bad guy in the music industry. Okay. But what I'm trying to say is this: is that is that there is a language that's being spoken by the world. Somebody said self, right? So we could say. Some of the language of the world is something kind of like YOLO. You only live once. Somebody yesterday went to him. Look, I used to be like this. Let's use that as an example. I used to be like, you know, I, go, I remember one time, this is not anything funny. And, it, you know, maybe Danielle said, no, we don't have to take it off because this is who I was. But praise God, I was born a citizen of the world, but I've been born again as a Amen. citizen of the yes. kingdom. And now he's changing me. Yes. But I can remember one time after being a teenager, I already quit high school drinking all night long. And, and I remember I was with a bunch of dudes and I, and, I, and I guzzled a beer. And when I did, I smashed the, the beer on my, it's not funny, but I smashed the beer on my head. And I said, yeah, self-destruction, crank it up, man. <laughs> because that's part of the message of the world. Yeah. And people don't even realize it, that they're self-destructing themselves. Because part of the message of the world, however it's coming in, there's demon spirits behind it. And they're trying to prevent God's people from growing and continuing to allow the cross to have its way in their lives. The truth of the gospel says you must die to yourself. And you must die to the things of the world. And how does that say it? It says, I glory only in the cross of Jesus Christ. Through it, I have been crucified to the world. You are supposed to be crucified to the world. I am supposed to be crucified to the world. Its message is not supposed to affect me. I should be able as a citizen of the kingdom to be able to hear the message of the world and to say, no way, Jose, that I'm not letting that in. I'm not letting that in, whatever it is, wherever it's coming from, I'm not letting that in into my spirit because this is going to cause trouble between me and the Lord. I believe that. Look at Romans chapter 8, verses 28. Now, oh, before we go there, what's the, what's the language of the kingdom? Prayer. Prayer. Yeah. But guess what? This right here. See this book right here? This book right here. You put your nose in this book right here and ask the Holy Spirit to teach you something through it. This book right here will transform That's right. your life. It will transform your way of thinking. It will re-enculturate you. It will place the kingdom of God on the inside of you. The language of the kingdom of God will be put on the inside. This is a lifelong journey, my friend. You're not going to just catch... Listen, every time I think I know something, oh, Lord, he's so good and humbling. Get feeding me a piece of humble pie. Because I'm telling you, I'm just, I have learned so much in the last year about the word of God. Oh, Lord, thank you. Thank I don't want to be that guy that thinks he's figured something out, right? Help us, Lord. Speak the word. But whoever said prayer, praise God. Because you got to, when you bathe, when you bathe in prayer, the, whole, the word of God will, will illuminate to you yes. in a way like you've never seen before. When you become intimate with the Holy Spirit and part of your prayer is when you see when we preach, hallowed be thy name, hallowed be thy name. And right now, how he wants us, if, we, if, he, if we've been created in the image and likeness of him after we've been born again in Christ and he wants his image to be reproduced in the earth through us. Amen. Then whenever we spend time in prayer, he's going to start to show us the things in our heart and in our life that he wants to deal with. And he's going to cause the word of God come alive and whenever and if we put the word of God in our heart and we're praying and he has his way with us he's going to show us from the word through the spirit yeah. what is not going what is not right and what he wants to deal with amen yeah. it's important yeah. praise God so look at Romans but you don't have to look at it let me just read it Romans 8 28 through 29 and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God amen to them who are the called according to his purpose so sometimes things happen because if you read it, you can realize, he said, for, for in our infirmity, sometimes we don't even know what to pray. And, and the Holy Spirit helps us in our infirmities. And he prays through us with groanings. Amen. And God allows things to happen in our life for a purpose because all things work together for good. And then it says this, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image 
of his son. So he doesn't want us conformed and fashioned to look like the world. He wants us to be conformed into the image of his son. Now, I will go backwards just a second, and you don't have to go there. But where it says, don't be conformed in Romans 12 too, but instead be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Many of you already know this because you've heard me preach it. That word transformed is the same word in the Greek for transfigured. So when Jesus was transfigured, the word is comes where we get metamorphosis. The idea is, is that what's on the inside is actually shining out, coming out. Amen. So when you get born again, the kingdom of God's planted on the inside of you. And whenever you allow God to have his way, now the, the what what is God, what is the kingdom of God begins to flow out of you. Amen. So Philippians says this. I am confident of this very thing. He who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. He started it. He's going to finish it. If you let him, you got to let him. You got to yield to his will. You got to yield to his word. Amen. Hallelujah. Look at this. Here's, here's the last scripture for this one. Ephesians 5, 26. Why don't you put that up there for me? We'll just use, uh, we'll just use the King James Version for this. Ephesians 5, 26. So that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. He's talking about his bride right there. Yeah. Jesus is talking about his bride right there. And whether you realize it or not, you are his bride. See, when you said yes to Jesus, that makes men feel funny. If, you know, before they really like in, in there, good, then it makes them feel a little bit funny. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because men are macho like that. But no, I'm here to tell you that you, according to the scripture, you are the bride of Christ. He's Amen. the groomsman. You're the bride. Amen. Amen. And, and what I want you to know is this, is that he wants to sanctify her, his bride. He wants to sanctify you or sanctify yes. me. He wants to cleanse her. And that's part of that process that I've really been trying to hammer this point home, that the word of God mixed with prayer Listen, I don't want you to raise your hand, but do you read the Word of God? Have you read the Word of God? I'm not trying to browbeat anybody. I'm trying to encourage you to know that if you really want God to start working and to understand the things of God, you must put the Word of God on the inside of your heart. You need the Word of God. Amen? You need it. Amen? So He wants to sanctify you and I through... And what does the word sanctify mean? Separate. 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 Holy. The word is hagios. And it means holy. Clean. clean purify. Amen. He wants to make us look different than the world. He wants his people called by his name to be different than the world around them. Amen. And that's what the process of sanctification is. But listen, it's a mixture of the word with the Holy Spirit. Amen. One of the last things. Oh, I'll put this statement here. The word is a mirror that does not lie. And reveals to us the condition of our hearts. Yeah. Amen. Now, one of the things I wanted to say is now also with prayer, when we connect prayer to the word, because see, the psalmist said this in Psalm 51. He said, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Does anybody know how to sing that song over there? Uh, Naya, can you sing that song? Yeah. That Keith Green song. Okay, I'm going to turn this on. We're going to just let you repeat that verse a couple times. Test mic. Hallelujah. This is good when we do this. We get used to everybody's gifts in the house. Praise God. Create Create in me a clean heart Oh Is we should be praying this all the time. Yes. Right? Created me a clean heart, oh Lord. Yes. 
and renew a right spirit within you. But the word of God is a mirror, amen? It's Ephesians 4, I'm mean, sorry, Hebrews 4, 12. The word of God is quick and alive, and it's more powerful than a two-edged sword. Yes. And it reveals, divides asunder, joint and marrow, soul and spirit. It's a revealer of the intents and the thoughts of the heart, amen? So the word of God is a mirror that does not lie. You know, look, I'm just going to tell you this real quick. Uh, this is interesting to me. It's just a thought, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. But in the book of Exodus, whenever the Lord was giving Moses the uh, schematics, if you will, for the tabernacle, when it came to the bronze laver, okay, you'd have to go back. I didn't put the verse here. You'd have to go back and look it up. I think it's around chapter 25. Maybe. Um, he said that the base of the bronze laver was made out of the women, in the King James Version, the women's looking glass. Now, they didn't have mirrors back then that I know of, but they did have metal that was very, very shiny that the women would look at their reflection to make sure their hair looked okay. okay. And so what I'm trying to tell you is this, is that I believe my opinion of that interpretation is that at the bottom of the bronze labor, they made that bottom out of those looking glasses to where when the, when the priest had to go to wash himself, he viewed himself. And as he's washing himself, He's thinking about what he's about to do. Right. He's about to slit an animal's throat. Mm -hmm. He's about to bleed this innocent animal. And he's looking at himself. And it's like a reflection of himself. And that's what the Word of God will do. Right. It will cause you to see yourself. Yes. And it will always remind you, thank you for the blood, Lord. Always. Thank you for the blood, Lord. Jesus. Thank you for Because it's always going to bring you back Hallelujah. to the right. blood. Amen? Jesus. Praise God. So that was number two. Number three, listen, he's fashioning a body to place his head. I heard a preacher recently, I don't know, might have been got Curry, I'm not sure. But he's looking for a pair of shoulders where he can put his head. Somebody said that, and that was Solomon. good. <laughs> huh? Solomon said that. Okay, let's give credit where credit's due. And that's good stuff right there. He's looking for a pair of shoulders where he can put his head. See, you're his body. When you get born again and the Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of you, you are his body. And he's looking for a place where he can place his head. And this is what we need to understand. The head represents authority. Yes. Amen. He is the authority of the church. Pray. He, ha he has to be the authority of this church. That's why I have no choice but to, when I say wrangle, I'm not trying to wrestle with the Lord. But the Lord knows he's wrestling with me, I'm sure. And I'm sure I'm not the only one he's wrestling with, at least I hope not. But, but, I, but I will present myself to him and allow him to wrestle with me. And Lord, please touch my hip. Let me, let me lower myself so you don't have to touch my hip. Amen? Okay, yeah, praise yeah. God. Or make it walk different. That's a good prayer. Praise God. All right, so listen, now to John chapter 14, I want you to know this. Jesus prayed. He said, I will ask the Father. He will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him, but you know him because he abides with you and he will be in you. So when you become born again, the Holy Spirit already automatically lives on the inside of you. And he's the helper. The Holy Spirit is the helper. Now, what I want you to know is that, that number one, he helps you become more like Jesus. But look, I want to say this because I'm about to make a point. I hope you don't, I hope you don't take this, say that I'm saying something I'm not saying, but I'm about to say it. He not only helps you become more like Jesus, he helps others as he operates through your body the way he operated through Jesus. I don't think that y'all can. Listen, listen. He helps others at work, on the street, at Walmart in the parking lot. Come on. When you knock on their door, I'm going to go to the jail today. I'm, I got to remind myself. And I can't eat too much sushi because I'm going to get tired. I'm going to go to the jail today and I'm going to preach the truth. And I'm like, God's going to use this body to walk my, my feet over there to that place. He's going to use my hands to open up the word of God. He's going to use my mouth to speak forth the word of God. And I'm going to believe God that a seed will be planted in these people's heart and that God will do something in their life. But he got to have a body. He's got to have a head place where he can place his head. Because if he doesn't have a body, he's immobile. Yeah. He's looking for a body. Yeah. He's no longer here in the physical except through you. In 2 Corinthians 13 and 14, he, and this is another thing that's so important. Because in order for him to manifest through your body, it says this. You, you can put that up there if you, if you got time. 
The grace of the Lord, 2 Corinthians 13, 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion, sometimes translated fellowship, of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. Amen. Fellowship with the Holy Spirit comes through prayer. Fellowship and the Word of God. But listen, no other place when it like it does through prayer. I'm talking about prayer where you're making a connection with God. When you're making a connection with worshipful prayer. Fellowship with the Holy Spirit comes through prayer. As we pray, we draw closer to God through the Holy Spirit. As we draw closer, He reveals His will for our lives, but also what He desires from us as His Body. He reveals to us what he desires from us as his body. If we spend time in prayer and we're willing to trust him with our hearts, he will show us those things that he wants to deal with. If we don't spend time in prayer, if we don't get intimate with the Lord, then we're not allowing him to have access to our hearts. When we say, search my heart and try my reins, oh Lord. No, we have to spend time in the presence of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Look at this scripture. I, look, you can put it up there. 1 Corinthians 6 and 13. This is a good scripture. Now, I never saw it this way, and I got, I'm going to have to... I'm going to have to embolden the part I want you to really read, because you're going to get lost in the other stuff. You ready? I'm going to read it to you. Meats for the belly, and the belly for meats. But God shall destroy both it and them. You know, there's coming a day when you're not really going to... Well, I wouldn't say that because there is a Mary Supper of the Lamb but in Jesus 8. But the idea here is he's saying that this physical world is going to draw to a close. And there's yeah. not going to really, your, your belly is going to definitely be different. Let's at least put it that way, okay? But he says this. He says, now the body is not for fornication. Now, some people may say, well, I don't fornicate preacher, so you're not preaching to me anymore. Someone's going to go ahead and turn you off. Don't turn me off. He's talking specifically about fornication, but he wants you to know, and if you are fornicating, you need to stop that because it will send you to hell. Yeah. The Word of God says that fornicators and liars and perjurers will have their place in the lake of fire. I didn't write it. The Holy Spirit wrote it. It's my job to tell you that. Help us, Lord. Amen? All right. So the body is not for fornication, but it's for the Lord. That's the part I want you to see. Your body is for the Lord, and the Lord is for the body. The Lord uses your body, amen, upon the earth to minister for his will. Whenever I'm over there praying, when we started the message this morning, and, and he said, son, I hear your prayer. Most people want me involved in their life. I want my people involved in my life. You cannot be involved in the things that God is doing if your body is being utilized for the things of the world. Amen. You have to come to the realization that you must be sanctified by the Holy Spirit, that you must allow the Word of God to have His way in your heart and in your life. I know that I've been saying this a lot, but I'm going to do it again. Edwin, you just throw me that blanket just for a second. And I promise you, I'm going to go ahead and just, I'm going to tuck you in real quick. Throw it to me, Shelby, from right where you are. Come on. I've been preaching this lately, and I know y'all talked about it. I know y'all remember this. But the Lord revealed something to me, and I don't even know if you like it, but you need to. Because it's, I believe it's the truth. When we get a revelation of the justification by faith, that the next thing you know, we start like we're starting to live under this blanket of justification. And we're like, I'm no longer guilty. Hallelujah. That's what the word of God says. And we're over here walking underneath it and we're feeling real good about ourselves. But can I tell you something? If the word of God says that liars don't enter the kingdom of God, if the word of God says fornicators don't enter the kingdom of God, if the word of God says murderers don't enter the kingdom of God, and if Jesus said that you think that it was back, then even if you hate your brother, listen to me church we better not get so high and mighty in our mind and disregard the rest of the scripture and hide under the blanket of justification and then we get into this this mode where we say i just got to struggle i'm just struggling right now and i understand that i understand that sanctification is a process i want you to know i know that it takes time for the lord to chisel away it takes time for the lord to carve away those things that are like i get that but listen to me sometimes okay not you not you pastor matt 
There have been times in Pastor Matt's walk where he snuggled his struggle. You're not supposed to snuggle your struggle. You're not supposed to get comfy with the things that are in your life that are contrary to the word of God. Those things are supposed to be crucified in Christ. Hallelujah. Lord, we put ourselves, take us and put us on the cross. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, Lord. Crucify our flesh, oh Lord God, in the name of Jesus. He fashions the body into the image of Jesus because Jesus still ministers to humans through the Holy Spirit. And now he uses our bodies to minister through because we are his body on earth. Is it, is it, let me ask you a question. Is it heresy for me to say that you now become Jesus on earth? I, I mean, it feels kind of funny to say it, but I'm pretty sure that's exactly what's happening here. That's exactly what's happening here. That you and I, as we yield ourselves to him, the Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit that was in him, that was healing through him, teaching through him, performing miracles through him, is the same Holy Spirit that's on the inside of us and wants to mobilize this body because he calls us his body. Hallelujah. This is for the individual. Next week, you're going to become a transformer. <laughs> he's going to start taking a whole bunch of individuals and putting them together into a big old thing called a body. And he's about to start shaking some stuff. That's what I believe. Because he's got a plan for that world. And he's looking for some people to come together and to unite and to operate. Amen. But that's next week. The Holy Spirit wants to fashion and mold a body of unity. But Satan wants to separate. Satan wants to divide. He wants to sever. Oh, he wants to dismember. I'm almost done, guys. I'm almost done. Hang in there just a little bit longer. He wants to sever and dismember the body piece by piece. Right. You are an individual body part, and he wants you gone. Yep. Now, listen. The other morning, I've only shared this with maybe one or two people. I'm not sure how many. The other morning, I was praying somewhere like right around there, and I was praying for business. And I don't think this was just for businesses. That's just what I was praying about. Businesses in our church. People in our church. In my, matter of fact, I felt like the Holy Spirit wanted me to ask you this. How many people own their own business in the church today? Okay. We, yes. Praise God. We have, yes. We have a few people that have, biz, that have businesses. And some of them might have more employees than others. Amen. So this is, this is what I was praying for y'all's businesses. I didn't, and that's why I wanted y'all to raise y'all's hands. I don't think I was thinking about everybody. I was praying specifically for one business at the time. And I'm not saying that this word is for that business. But that's what I was praying about when it happened. And all of a sudden, I got one of those visions. One of those visions is what I call it. And it was a pack of hyenas. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with hyenas or not. But hyenas are the most disgusting animals. They're the most demonic animals. Yes. I've watched video on these things before, and I'm telling you, it is the most horrendous sight that you would ever, ever, you don't want to see this. I'm not even telling you, uh, look, you may go Google it later, but that's on you. You may already know, and if you've already seen it, then you know what I'm talking about. You know what you call a grouping of hyenas? A cackle. Yep. Because they laugh. You, think, you reckon demons aren't laughing? Yeah, yeah. So hyenas hunt, but they, the way that they hunt, and I mean, they're probably similar to wolves, but hyenas are just smooth. They're on a whole other level. So in this vision, while I was praying, that's basically all it was. It was real quick. It was just a pack of hyenas, and they had surrounded their prey. But I went back, and I watched a couple of videos. Because you see, what a hyena wants to do is he wants to separate, isolate, but then I'm going to use a medical word. He wants to eviscerate. Now, Sean knows what that's talking about because we took nursing school. And in nursing school, when a person's having abdominal surgery and they're, they get an infection and the incision doesn't do right, it, it, there's a chance it can open up and a full, you can have a... Listen, I'm not trying to get all technical, but you can have a dehiscence, which is just the tissue part of the disease. But then you can have an evisceration where your insides spill. Wow. wow. The enemy of your soul wants to separate, isolate, and eviscerate. The way that hyenas work is they cause all kind of confusion right here. And they're laughing and they're getting all up on their prey, and nobody realizes, but one of them sneaks behind the backside. 
And then he starts to eat the inside out. And that's what the enemy does. Yeah. He causes a bunch of confusion, whatever it is, a bunch of a bunch of stuff in your life. He's going to bring something in the forefront of your life. He's going to bring some kind of a new man, some kind of a new woman. He's going to bring some kind of a new op job opportunity. He's going to bring a bunch of strife in your home. He's going to bring something, and it's going to uh, he's going to bring new turmoil on the on the world scene, and you're going to be stressing over it, like oh my god, and all this stuff's happening, and when you don't even realize it. One of them coming from behind, and he's trying to attack you from behind. And he's trying to separate and isolate, and ultimately he wants to start working on the insides. I'm talking about your spiritual innards, yeah. the part of your heart. Listen, church, I can't, I can't tell you how important it is for us to keep our heart pure before the Lord. No matter how, listen, the devil is so tricky. You have to learn how to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit to the point where when you feel that little nudge in your heart that you know is not the Holy Ghost, that you take that to the Lord and you let him deal with that like right now yes. in a hurry. You cannot let that stuff fester in your heart. And you know it when it's gone, church. Amen. That's so important that you keep your heart soft before the Lord. Listen, if you have any kind of ought in your heart, I want to encourage you. Like towards people, listen, if people hurt you, they weren't supposed to hurt you. They were not supposed to hurt you, especially church people. And listen, if I've ever hurt you, I've done this before, but I'll do it again. I'm so sorry if I hurt you. I can promise you I never intended to hurt you. Okay. But you've got to let it go. I have to let it go. Just like, I have to let it go. You, But you don't know what they did. I understand that, but Jesus can heal it. Amen. That's right. You don't want them hyenas on you. Because listen, what they're trying to do is they're trying to separate you. They want to destroy it. They want to sever. They want to sever. They want businesses to implode. Mm. They want families to implode. Yeah. Yeah. They want to separate the children yeah. from the father and the father yes. from the children. Yeah. Listen, I know what they did. Yeah. They ain't no good. They, they wicked. Jesus. Okay. They want to cause a bunch of confusion. But Lord, and they want to separate churches. You know, and one of the things I'll tell you is this. The Holy Spirit showed me this is bigger than the church. It's bigger than your church. Yeah. This is people's lives. Right, right. Listen, right. listen, listen. And this, you know what the Apostle Paul said? He said, we're not ignorant of his schemes. Right. We need to be come to the place, spiritually speaking, that we're no longer ignorant of the schemes of the devil. Amen? All right.